Before we get started, check out my new shirt. I got this from Dead Ink Books, obviously. Amazing indie publisher. Go support them. Novellas are amazing things. I really love, I cherish short fiction. Every kind of prose has its place, whether it be beefy long novels, mid-size ordinary length novels, novellas, or short stories. They're all great in their own way and they all serve different purposes. I personally have a real soft spot for short stories and novellas. So here are 11 novellas that I absolutely adore. Door. This video was inspired by the fact that I just picked up these two fantastic novellas that I can't wait to talk about, and I'll start with them first. As for what defines a novella, it kind of differs depending on the person. There's a word count that you're expected to exceed, but then not push beyond. Most of the books on this list have been defined as novellas by the author or the publisher, and the ones that haven't are roughly the same length, so that'll do. Typically, I would see a novella as something around 150 pages in length or less, maybe up to 200, depends who you ask. Also, why 11? Because right now it's November. Novella November is a thing that people do, I think, and November is the 11th month, right? And I couldn't pick 10, so here's 11. First up, this is Thorn Hedge by T. Kingfisher. I've talked about T. Kingfisher a lot in the past. She is one of my favorite writers of the modern day. She's incredible, writing lots of weird horror and dark fantasy stories, and this is a kind of dark fantasy story. It is a riff on several classic fairy tales created as something wholly new. Thorn Hedge is 120 pages long, and it's told from the perspective of a fairy, kind of. Her name is Toadling. She was born initially as a princess to a king and a queen, but she was immediately snatched away by the fairies and replaced with a changeling, very Midsummer Night's Dream. She then grew up in the fairy world and she learned magic. And that's really all the blurb tells us about her. Because when the novel begins, what we actually get is a description of this tower, which is surrounded by enormous thorn bushes, brambles the length of your arm. A thing that for centuries people have been curious about, they've wanted to know what is beyond the thorns, and so quite often, especially knights, come along and try and cut it down and get through it. There are stories that are passed down orally and eventually through books that there is a princess in this tower, and our protagonist Toadling protects the tower. That's what she does. She sits there, sometimes in the form of a toad, and she watches people. She doesn't know much about the extended world, and at one point a knight comes along, a wonderful himbo, who kind of catches her up and tells her what's been going on for all these centuries. And he says he wants to get to the tower just like everyone else does. But he's a little different. He's a cutie pie. As the story goes on, we learn more about the tower and who or what is in there, whether the stories are true, what exactly happened to Toadling, the details of her birth and her growing up in the fairy world, and why she now watches over this tower. There's quite a lot of mystery here. This is a tale that kind of takes Sleeping Beauty and Rapunzel and smushes them together, while also creating, as I said, something wholly new and also being inspired by Shakespeare. This is a fantastic and strange dark fantasy. Toadling is a really fun character to follow, she has a lot of agency, she's often confused and frightened, and as the story goes on you start to really pity her and kind of worry about her. Our himbo knight is a Muslim guy who turns out to be incredibly sweet and really bad at being a knight, and the two of them have this wonderful chemistry that I really enjoyed. So much happens over the course of 120 pages, and this book reminded me why I love novellas so much. There's so much strangeness and excitement that needs to be packed in, as well as plenty of twists and turns. I was so impressed by Thornhedge. T. Kingfisher does not let me down. She didn't hear. This is a dark and strange twist on Shakespearean fairy tales and Grimm's tales, and I'm very, very impressed. This is something really, really dark and gnarly. This is The Salt Grows Heavy by Cassandra Kaur. Cassandra Kaur is a New York-based writer who works on video games and has written a lot of fiction, and this is the first thing by them that I've read. This is also 120 pages and published in the UK by Titan, just like Thornhedge was. I had a lot of fun reading both of these back to back, but this one is real twisted up. This is also inspired by fairy tales. Our protagonist is a mermaid, but as you can see from the cover, not what you generally picture when you think mermaid. As the novel opens, she is standing outside of a house, 
where her two newborn children are eating their father, a father who is incredibly cruel and twisted, and cut out the mermaid's tongue. She cannot speak for a good stretch of this novella. As she's standing outside of this house, she is beckoned away by a plague doctor, whose gender is not specific, and who is standing there in this crow-shaped mask. And the two of them set out on a journey. The plague doctor is surprisingly charming. For all of this bleakness and strangeness, there's a kind of humour and charm in the way that they speak. Through very, very little, very bare-bones exposition, we learn that the empire that they are walking away from has destroyed itself. It's unclear if this is a literal thing or a kind of metaphorical thing that's happened, but eventually they walk into a forest where they meet a group of young boys, one being hunted and chased by the others, and then immediately killed. Our protagonists, the mermaid and plague doctor, are shocked by what they see, and ask the boys what the hell's going on, and they basically explain that they're part of some sort of cult or religion or country, something, where there are these immortal godlike saints, these three men that stand atop everything and are able to resurrect this boy. They've done it before, they've done it to all the boys, and it's a show of power. And as the novella goes on, we learn more and more about these people, these strange rituals, the very strange traditions that they have, and how dangerous they are. And not too far into it, we learn that the Plague Doctor comes from this place, was also resurrected by these people. This is given away early on. And the rest of the novella is these two people kind of at war with these saints. There is so much blood and guts and gore here, organ removal, people staying alive, people being experimented on. It is really, really twisted and gnarly. It is absolutely discomforting. You will squirm, you will feel uneasy. It is not nice in any way, except for, as I said, the aforementioned charming and sometimes funny dialogue. Yeah, this is not for the faint of heart at all. It kind of bummed me out in just how bleak and strange and twisted it is. It kind of reminded me of the film Mad God. I don't know, check it out if you can bear it. I really enjoyed it, obviously, but not everyone will. I really didn't plan for the first three books of this stack to all be retellings of old fairy and folk tales, but here we are. This is The Swallowed Man by Edward Carey. Like T. Kingfisher, Edward Carey is one of my favourite authors. His book Little sits just here at the top, pride of place, because this is one of my favourite novels of all time. And The Swallowed Man is a charming and very intelligent novella that tells the story of Geppetto from inside the whale after he is swallowed. He's the swallowed man. Edward Carey is a writer, but he's also an illustrator, and like all of his other books, there are illustrations in this. The illustration on the cover is also one that he did. They're everywhere, and they're beautiful. This is a retelling of Pinocchio, but it's very much about Geppetto, and it even goes beyond Geppetto as well. While he's inside the whale, he finds a shipwreck, and he finds the journal of the captain, and he reads it and gets to know the captain, gets to know the history of the ship and the people who were on it. We spend a surprising amount of time in the whale, but also obviously in his mind as we flash back and he's dwelling on his memories, etc. This is Pinocchio like you've never seen it. And curiously, Pinocchio is everywhere right now. There have been several film adaptations, one by Guillermo del Toro. There was the Korean video game Lies of P, which I really enjoyed and this. Pinocchio is everywhere, and I'm really glad that people are going crazy with their retellings and reinterpretations, and Edward Carey's is stellar, stunning, 10 out of 10 perfect, because he's always incredible. His capacity for empathy is unmatched, and The Swallowed Man shows it. Okay, now it's time for a bit of sci-fi, and we'll start with This Is How You Lose The Time War. I did a dedicated video about this book because I had so much to say, and it is just so starkly beautiful. This was co-written by authors Amal El Mokhtar and Max Gladstone, and they are an amazing team. The story is told from two different perspectives, where we follow two different soldiers who are part of two different armies that have been going head to head for a long time in a war that spans time and space. And these two characters were written by the two authors. The chapters have a specific formula. We will have a chapter that describes what one of the soldiers gets up to, 
and then a letter that they leave for the other one, and then the other one's chapter, and their letter. And that's how it goes. It's kind of like a drum pattern, where it goes one, two, three, four, and then repeats. It's gorgeous. These two soldiers are on opposing sides, and this is a science fiction war taking place, as I said, in space, but also through different timelines. It's insane where they go and what they do. From a far-flung future full of mechs, to Shakespeare's England and Plato's Greece, and all the while, these two soldiers are slowly falling in love. They leave each other taunting letters just for a bit of fun, but they are both becoming disenchanted by the war and steadily falling in love with each other. It is such a wonderful piece of science fiction, a beautiful blossoming romance, and a book that I've just never forgotten. It's a really, really lovely, perfectly crafted novella from two amazing writers that clearly had fun putting this together. The other sci-fi novella I want to talk about is To Be Taught If Fortunate by Becky Chambers, who is probably the crown queen of science fiction right now. And she's proven worthy of that crown, especially with this. This is perhaps her smartest piece of writing. It's a short novella written in a very hard sci-fi style. If you don't know what that means, hard sci-fi is less fantastical, less Star Wars, more grounded, based on things that could be, might be, or maybe are possible. So all of the science fiction elements in here are things that don't seem too far-fetched. This is set in a kind of socialist future where a grassroots NASA-style agency has blossomed thanks to the support of people all around the world, and they have sent a crew into space to a specific solar system to scan and explore and relay their findings on different planets and moons in this solar system. They go from place to place, and they have this bit of scientific chemical equipment that allows them to slightly alter their DNA just enough to match their surroundings, to be able to withstand slightly heavier gravity, but nothing too extreme, slightly more cold, slightly more heat, stuff that you feel like, yeah, that could be possible. And all the while we get to know the crew and we watch as they explore and come up against things they didn't expect, and they have to overcome it. This is very much, like all of her books, a story of hope, and friendship, and love, and hope again. Hope is such an important thing when it comes to her writing, the idea that people will succeed, and things will get better, and things are gonna be okay. We will persevere, we are intelligent, we are artistic and creative and beautiful things, and we can do this, together. That's what this book is all about, and I think it is stunning. I need to reread this because To Be Taught If Fortunate is a truly special novella, a special piece of science fiction. This is Boulder by Eva Baltazar, a short Catalan novella translated by Julia Sanchez. It tells the story of a nameless woman who works as a cook on a merchant ship that is currently off the coast of Chile. While she's on the ship, she kind of falls head over heels in love with a woman called Sansa. The two of them enter a very aggressively sexual relationship, and our protagonist, who gets nicknamed Boulder, can't tear herself away from Sansa, and so the two of them end up moving to Reykjavik when Sansa gets a job there. This is the story of their life together, their love together, and it's a really, really difficult one. The reason it's difficult is that Samza wants to have a child. She's now around the age of 40, and now is the time. She needs to have a kid, but Boulder doesn't want one. And so their life gets difficult. Their love gets difficult, and we're not sure if it can last. Again, I've done a video on this book if you want to check it out. This is an amazing piece of sapphic literature. I think it's the only Catalan story I've ever read, and I'd like to read more. Eva Baltazar is an amazing writer. Julia Sanchez is an amazing translator, and this is a really, really harsh piece of sapphic literary fiction, all wrapped up in a very, very tiny little novella. Check it out. Now let's talk about two Japanese novellas. The first, Fingerbone by Hiroki Takahashi. This was translated by Takami Nieda and published by Honford Star. This is one of many, many, many war stories in fiction. There are so many war novels and war films out there, especially set during World Wars I and II. This is a Japanese novella set during World War II that is very, very different from all of the rest. Kind of like at Night All Blood Is Black by David Diop, which is an amazing French story. This is also a brutal kind of fiction that places you on the front line and just makes you feel dismally sad about the state of war and what it does. This novella follows a nameless Japanese soldier who has been stationed in the jungles of Papua New Guinea, 
About half of it is set at a war hospital, as men are recovering or dying from their wounds or from exposure to the elements. He's in this hospital and he gets to know some of the soldiers and they could easily become lifelong friends, but they might not make it. He might not make it. This is a story about what war does to the individual. War is often seen as a kind of chess game. You look down on a map from below and you see all of the moving parts. But war is not clockwork. War is people suffering. And Fingerbone reminds us of that really, really beautifully. This is an incredible Japanese novella that you need to check out if you never have. This is something pretty special. This is Ms. Ice Sandwich by Mieko Kawakami. I've talked about Kawakami a thousand times. She's one of my favorite Japanese authors. And this was the first thing from her that I ever read. It was translated by Louise Hiel Kawai and published by Pushkin Press. Before Picador Press picked up all of her full length novels and started publishing them year after year after year. It was in lockdown in the summer of 2020 when I read this sitting in a garden and it brought happy tears to my eyes. This is a truly remarkable little thing. A tiny Japanese novella that you can read in an afternoon and then just read it again and keep it in your pocket and pull it out and read it whenever you need to feel something good. I don't remember the details of it anymore, but this is a novella that, like many of these, has just never left me. It tells the story of a boy who goes into a supermarket and kind of falls in love with the cashier there. He just likes to look at her and admire her. He goes in there and buys something and watches the way that she packs up all of the stuff. She has this kind of punk aesthetic where she doesn't care what other people think and say and he's taking inspiration from that because he's a teenager who's going through a lot. We learn about his mother, his grandmother, his family at large. Life is hard, family is hard, school is hard. And he goes to the supermarket and sees this pretty girl with this kind of fuck you attitude that he really admires and looks up to. And it's one of these moments where it seems like he's in love but also just admiring someone that is perhaps a little bit older than him and someone he thinks is cool. And he calls her Ms. Ice Sandwich. I think because she stacks the sandwiches and I think because she has this eyeshadow that's sort of an icy blue color, I'm sure that's where he gets it from. I need to reread this. Ms. Ice Sandwich is just a delightful read. Miyako Kawakami always knows what she's doing and this was an amazing start to my journey reading her, an author who would eventually become one of my favorites. And this is Small Things Like These by Irish author Claire Keegan. This is a novella that I have talked about multiple times. This is the third video in recent months where I've mentioned this novella because it's beautiful and very important. As I said in my first video, I was kind of annoyed by some of the critical feedback this got, especially by users on Goodreads who really missed the point of this book, but you can go check that video out if you wanna hear me rant about it a bit. Small Things Like These is set in the 1980s in a small community in Ireland. Our protagonist is a middle-aged man He's married, he has kids, and his family, like the rest of the community, are God-fearing people. They go to church every Sunday, they all know each other, they all gossip about each other, and this is the story of the week leading up to Christmas. Our protagonist works at a lumber yard. We watch him work, we watch him go to mass, we watch him talk to his wife, and we watch how his relationship to the community, and most importantly, to the hypocrisies of organized religion, all slowly unfold, unfurl, and collapse around him. This is a novella that primarily focuses on the hypocrisies of organized religion. What the church does to people, the way that specific members or groups of members within the church treat ordinary people, especially young people. It's a pretty dark thing, but it's also kind of hopeful in a sense. Since it's set in the lead up to Christmas and it's December next month, I might give this another read. I only read it a few months ago and I'm already ready to return to it because this left an impact. Claire Keegan is an incredible writer. I've done a video on the genius of Claire Keegan that you should go check out. Read this. My penultimate pick is Paradise Rot by Jenny Haval, who is a very internationally famous Norwegian singer-songwriter. It was translated by Marjam Idris, who did a stunning job. And again, this is a book that I've got a full video on. I remember when I made that video, I called this a book that is part of a genre that I loosely at the time called Gross Women. Books by women that are unapologetically disgusting, sometimes visceral, sometimes horror-fueled, gothic, full of queerness and sexuality, and can often make you feel kind of uneasy in their bodily grossness. 
Paradise Rot is like that. It is one of those books, and I love it for that. This is one of the most perfectly, aggressively, disgustingly feminist pieces of fiction. I think it's awesome. It tells the story of a young Norwegian student named Joe who has moved to another city in another country to study at university. The way that the place is described, I think it's the UK, but it doesn't matter. When she gets there, she needs somewhere to live, and she ends up living with a local woman in a converted brewery where they have this enormous open-plan space where everything is divided up kind of like cubicles in an office floor, so all these divides between rooms are not real. Everything is only so high off the ground, and that includes things like the bathroom, so there is no privacy here. This is very much a shared, intimate space, and the space itself is a character. This is a gross kind of a book, a book that feels very claustrophobic and gothic and intense. The writing and translation is utterly flawless, and I was pretty mesmerized by it. It's wonderfully immersive in its tone, its setting, and what happens throughout the story, even though arguably not a lot happens. This is all about atmosphere and how the characters are feeling at any given moment. If you haven't read Paradise Rot, check it out and check out Jenny Haval's music as well, she's incredible. And finally, we have a gothic classic that I had never read before, never even heard of until fairly recently. This is The Black Spider by Jeremias Gotthelf. He was a Swiss author, and he was absolutely part of that famous gothic canon, and yet I guess he was kind of forgotten, because as I said, I'd never heard of him before. This novella was translated by Susan Bonofsky, and it tells the story of a family, a small community, that live in a valley in Switzerland. While a celebration is going on, I think it's a christening, the old man of the family, the patriarch, is sat there staring at this old wooden beam. He talks about how the house has been rebuilt and fixed up many times, but some parts of it are old bones, and he's staring at this piece of wood that is hundreds upon hundreds of years old, and he tells the story of what this valley used to be in the medieval period. And that's when the real story begins, the story of a group of serfs that have to serve this terrible, terrible lord who sits in a castle overlooking everybody and demands too much from them. They are starving because they have to serve his needs, and eventually they are tempted into help from some dark force and that unleashes really gothic, strange, horror stuff. Impossible things, like a person turning into a big black spider. It's absolutely wild. Really Castle of Otranto vibes. If you love old gothic fiction, you have to check out The Black Spider. I read it as part of this day where I tried to read five books in one day, and they were all short stories novellas, poetry, etc. And I did it, and I think this was the last one. I was beaten down by the end of it, but it was worth it. The Black Spider is very memorable, very strange and dark and brilliant. There you go, 11 novellas for you to read. And if Novella November is a thing, which I think it is, then read these. It's November. Enjoy. Good. If you enjoyed this, I have a Patreon. You can support it, and you can subscribe for books.